uh, invented the character, really. Uh, he created the Michael Myers mask. He was the guy who uh, decided that uh, you could take a William Shatner Captain Kirk mask, spray paint it white and tease out the hair. That man, his name was Tommy Lee Wallace, and he was born right here in Somerset, Kentucky. Really? Uh, Did you know that? I didn't know He's that. kind of a local legend we have here, and not a lot of people in Somerset are really familiar with the past, or with the idea that, that this man was a kind of a local legend of ours. Uh, as you can see, he's right here in this case. Uh, that he worked and did a lot of the stunts for the original Halloween film. Tommy Lee Wallace was actually one of the production designers on all John Carpenter's early movies. He was responsible for a lot of the uh, prop elements, the masks, costume elements, anything design-wise that you saw in the films. Uh, mm -hmm. A man from here in Somerset was responsible for it. So he's kind of a local That's legend that we like to acknowledge here. He went on to direct, mm -hmm. I think I heard you say this, part three. he went on to direct <laughs> Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. I know it's no one's particular favorite, I guess, Halloween movie. It is your favorite Halloween movie. Yes. Okay, yes. well, I respect that. It's an it's yes. underrated film. I feel, like, yes. I feel like it's finally getting its... Uh, it's, it's rewards for yeah, after years of mediocrity, but he, um, or obscurity, not mediocrity, but he, uh, he directed Halloween 3, but maybe more importantly than that, he also directed, I don't know if you've seen, I'm, I'm sure you have, the original It film from the 1990s, uh, but Tommy Lee Wallace, a man from here in Somerset, he adapted the screenplay and uh, directed the original It film as well. So I always tell people who tour the museum that the legend of Michael Myers and the legend of Pennywise, in one point of view, was born right here in Somerset, Kentucky. And that's that flashlight right there. That's a screen use prop from the original Friday the 13th film. Uh, you can actually see the camera on, or the, excuse me, you can see the flashlight on camera in the, uh, in the shots back there. About halfway through the film, one of the characters, her name is Marcy. She had to use the restroom there at Camp Crystal Lake. And, yeah. uh, she went that way carrying that flashlight. Unfortunately, Marcy did not make it back. <laughs> That's a death sentence in a horror movie. I feel like going off by yourself. And uh, she ended up getting an axe to the head. But the, the flashlight that she carried in that scene ended up making it uh, its way back here to our, our gallery. And it was actually signed by the actress herself. Who perform with art. We have a lot of screen use props and prop replicas in our in our film here, right in our gallery here. Like I said, uh, here at the Nightmare Gallery, we we cover all things that go bump in the night. So this case over here kind of deals with UFO history, uh, extraterrestrials. Uh, we have a lot of UFO history in the state of Kentucky. Really, we have a lot of UFO history. Just gosh. 20, 30, 40 miles from where we're standing right now. And I'm gonna talk all about that here in just a few minutes. But before I get to all that UFO history, I wanna talk about this fellow right here. Um, when we first established the Nightmare Gallery last summer, I was determined every six months or so to induct another legendary researcher, someone whose work kind of uh, inspires us. Well, this was the first one we inducted. His name's Glenn Campbell. You may not have heard of his name, you might not have seen his face, but I bet you've heard of Area 50. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Glenn Campbell is maybe partly responsible for that. In the 1980s and 1990s, Glenn lived in the little town of Rachel, Nevada, which is the closest town to Area 51. Uh, Glenn knew the government was up to something out there in Tickaboo Valley, and he was trying to figure out what it was. Uh, he went to a lot of the newspapers, a lot of the, um, the television channels, NBC, ABC, CBS, and kept talking about this place. He was the one who kind of brought the name Area 51 into the, into the mainstream. Uh, here's Glenn's strategy. Glenn bought a pair of high-power binoculars, and uh, he found a mountaintop that he could sit on at all hours of the day and night and just sort of watch. Area 51, and that's what he did. It was his form of entertainment for, for years, was to just sit and watch the base. He knew when people got off to work, when new people came in. He knew the flight schedule in and out of there. Well, finally, the government found out what Glenn was doing. So they sent a detachment of troops up to get rid of this, this UFO nut. Uh, when they got up there, they said, Glenn, you can't, you can't be here. And Glenn said, oh, yes, I can. This is public land. And they said, it's not public land anymore. If you look at the little dotted line on that map on the left, that's the border of Area 51. Do you see how jagged it is down mm -hmm. there south of Rain? The reason for that is because of Glenn Gamble. Every time <coughs> you find a mountaintop, the government would it, it <laughs> absorb it. So one by one by one, they took all of the places that he would, he would watch the base from, except for one. Shortly before Glenn died, he found a place called Tickaboo Peak. Uh, he was determined it's 13 miles from the base, and he was convinced that, that there was no way the government could ever take that land so far away, and they haven't. So still to this day, the only place in the world that you can go without government clearance. And see Area 51 with your naked eyes, 
is take a boot peek uh, in the Nevada desert. Glenn wrote a book uh, trying to explain how to get there. He was all about government, you know, transparency and that sort of thing. So he was kind of a, a legendary researcher that we that we have a lot of respect for here at the um, uh, at the gallery. Uh, well, over here in this case uh, at the bottom, I have uh, many of the common ghost hunting instruments that you might see, you know, ghost hunters use. You might even see some of these on the prominent ghost uh, television shows. Ghost hunters believe that EMF detectors can be used to sort of communicate or at least detect the presence of the, of the, the dead. Uh, the electronic voice phenomenon. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept or not, but EVPs, uh, ghost hunters will use digital audio recorders to, what they'll do is they'll go into a haunted house, they will turn that on, ask a series of questions, leaving a little bit of a pause between each question, and then sometimes when they play that recording back, there might be another voice on the tape. They call that an EVP. My personal favorite though, you know, there's little brass rods down there on the left corner. Do you even know what those are? Dowsing. Dowsing rods, yeah, absolutely. You know, ghost hunters will take those things, hold them out straight, try to keep their arms really steady, ask a series of questions at a haunted location. And sometimes if those little rods will nod over and cross or kind of pull apart, it's kind of maybe evidence that uh, they're getting some sort of spiritual communication. Um, all things considered, though, I have a lot of people coming in here and they say, I don't believe in dowsing rods. I don't think that's real. But really, I hate to tell them, the dowsing rods go way back, way back, farther than ghost hunting. They were originally used like a thousand years ago and even up till recent times as well. Do you mind know what the, what the original use for dowsing? Fine water. Fine water. You're exactly right. They called it water witching. You know, walk around the field. When they cross, you know, that's where you need to dig. That's where you need to dig your well. And uh, yeah, it worked like a charm for years. Now, a lot of people, over the years at a lot of these different events, uh, we have indeed met a lot of people. Uh, we've, we've talked to people and, and over the years, a lot of people come to us and said, hey, I've got something in my house, an object that I no longer want in my house because I think it may or may not be, be haunted. Well, the items in this case, in this case, are just a few of the ones that uh, we've been given over the years. Uh, by no means is this all of them. Actually, there was a, there was a woman in here yesterday who dropped off a, a really gnarly piece that I have not had a chance to uh, get it on display just yet. But uh, again, next time, if, if, if the story that they told me is true, it might be the most... Uh, ridiculously paranormally active piece in this whole museum. But let's start with these dolls right here. About five years ago, my wife works in the hospital here in Somerset. She has a co-worker, and this is very important by the way, this co-worker does not believe in ghosts. Well, this co-worker, she inherited those two dolls from her grandmother when her grandmother passed away. At first, this co-worker who did not believe in ghosts well, it's exciting, you know, inherited a nice couple of uh, porcelain dolls. It was a nice memento from her grandmother's life. So she brought them on home. Well, almost immediately, this woman's two young sons started complaining to their mother. They said, Mom, the dolls, Grandma's dolls, the porcelain dolls, are moving around in the night. They claim to have seen them. They claim to have heard them. And they claim that they were, they were scared. Well, this woman, again, she didn't believe in ghosts, so her automatic assumption was that the kids were lying to their mom. So she said, hey, you know, you know what happens to kids who lie to their moms? They're going to get a spanking. They're going to get a whipping. And, and she kind of threatened these kids to try to get them to tell the truth. But they didn't change their story. Every morning, the story was the same. The dolls were moving last night. The dolls were moving last night. Weeks later, and the woman, of course, never believes this the whole time, it takes weeks before she starts to feel a little odd about it and then finally the kids come to her and the youngest son says mom it's the dolls aren't just moving anymore now they're they're hurting us she said hurting you the little boy nodded he pulled up his sleeve and there were deep scratch marks up and down his arms that matched just perfectly with the porcelain fingers on those dolls all of a sudden this woman started believing in ghosts. She threw those two dolls into a black plastic garbage bag, tied it off, and took it to work. Well, she knew my wife was working. She knew we were interested in this sort of thing, and we've had them on display uh, ever since. Since we opened last August, we've had hundreds of guests come to the museum. I would say no fewer than 20 to 30 to 40, possibly, have claimed to have seen these two dolls move. A young man was here last night 
and claim to have been watching that male doll and see his eyes move. About three weeks ago, I had a tour about the same size. It was coming through, but there was a young son on the tour as well. And I could tell that this boy was determined to see these two dolls move. He came over here and he pressed his face to the glass and was not gonna take his eyes off those dolls. Well, I continued with the tour around the room. We had actually made it all the way around the corner into the, the Bigfoot area. And all of a sudden we hear this young boy start screaming. We came rushing back around the corner, and I come around the corner just in time to see him back away from the case and bump right into the table here. And you could tell this kid was terrified about something, and he was pointing at the little boy doll. He said, I just saw the little boy die, uh, the doll's eyes dart over to him, and his right eye winked at it. Hands here. I know true crime is very popular right now. It seems like about every week there's a new show or a documentary on Netflix, Hulu, you know, any of the streaming, or even cable as well. Uh, I've always been interested in true crime myself. Uh, probably my favorite case, and I can't even say favorite. I don't know if you have a favorite killer. It's kind of strange. But, right. Uh, the one I'm most interested in, I'll put it like that, is probably the, the legend of, or the tale of Jack the Ripper. Uh, you know, they never figured out exactly who was doing those killings. There's Today, there's 50 or 60 possible uh, suspects that they've kind of narrowed it down to. These six people right here are the ones that I personally believe are the most likely suspects. However, I have people come in here all the time that tell me, and you are off base. Uh, just about three weeks ago, I had a guy come in here. He said, I don't even know why you're calling it Jack the Ripper. He said, you should be calling it Jane the Ripper. And he had an interesting theory that said that the Ripper must have actually been a woman. Of course, it was mostly prostitutes who were killed. And they said only another prostitute could have gotten in with these people close enough that after the killings had started, that they could have gotten into their level of trust enough to... I don't know, it was a fascinating theory, but I'm always hearing new theories here as well. Uh, in this case, you see a lot of uh, various different things. My wife and I have been over there on the Trail of the Ripper a couple times, and every time we're in England, we're trying to track down different replicas and artifacts and whatnot to bring home with us. But they're hard to find because they're not particularly proud of the Jack the Ripper phenomenon in England. Uh, I think they'd rather be known for the Beatles than as notorious, <laughs> you know, serial killer. So it's kind of hard to track these things down. I feel like here across the pond in the United States, we have more of an affinity for these, for these, uh, these real nightmare monsters. I mean, you know, the this is actually a period, I've reproduced it, but it's a period specific artwork. Uh, all of those are period specific designs that were commissioned by the Nazis in World War II in the attempt to win the war. You'll see newspaper articles I've reproduced from the era. Still to this day, there's these weird concrete octagonal like structures all over eastern germany and western poland for years nobody knew what they were now the theory is that those were supposed to be the landing pads for this ill-fated flying saucer program uh we go to a lot of big festivals like i suppose you all do as well well over the years i've spoken to a lot of the west coast bigfoot investigators you know people from washington oregon uh california and they always say this they always say zach i don't know why you all even bother hunting for Bigfoot in Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia. They say he's not out there. They say he's on our neck of the woods. He's in California, Washington, Oregon. If we're a Bigfoot country, he's not back east. And to them, I always say the same thing. I say, you must not read your history. Because if you did, you would know the earliest documented Bigfoot sighting was actually right here in Kentucky. A man named Daniel Boone was yep. on his way across the Cumberland Gap in 1777 when he claimed, all the biographers say so, to have encountered a big, hairy, Bigfoot-like creature in what is modern-day McCrary County, Kentucky. He didn't call it Bigfoot. That name didn't come around to the 1950s. He called it a Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo was a term used in uh, Gulliver's Travels, which was popular at the time, for big, hairy ape men. Uh, he called it a Yahoo. He claimed to have shot and killed it. Still to this day, 30 miles south of here in McCray County, Kentucky, there's a place called Yahoo Falls. It's a waterfall, a hiking trail. A lot of people go picnicking there. That, according to legend, is the local. That's why it's got the name Yahoo Falls. That's the, according to legend, is the place where Daniel Boone shot and killed the Bigfoot way back in the day. Now, when Bigfoot investigators find unusual tracks in the woods, what they will often do is they will take plaster of Paris, mix it with water, and they will pour that concoction into the footprint on the ground. When it hardens, they come away with things uh, like this over here. We call them foot casts. These are some of the most famous foot casts uh, in Bigfoot history. These are duplicates, second generation duplicates of many of these casts. You might have seen that video 
Uh, yeah. Back there in the back of Bigfoot, sort of lumbering through uh, Bluff Creek, California, 1967. Arguably the most famous footage ever collected of, of, of Bigfoot. This was a, uh, the cast that was made that day by the same guys who filmed uh, Bigfoot. So arguably the most famous piece of Bigfoot evidence ever discovered. This right here is my personal favorite, though. This came or was found in a place called Grays Harbor, Washington in 1982. A little lady up there owned a cranberry bog. And every night something was getting in there and sloshing around. So she called the police. It was a police officer by the name of Dennis Hereford who found the tracks. He was the one who cast it. He was the one who wrote about it in his police report. He was willing to stake his reputation on it. Today this cast is famous not just because of that iconic shape, because it was a lawman that found it, and not just some dude, I guess. <laughs> I like it spooky. I, uh, I want to thank you. Anything you want, you, you just name it.